If you're looking to buy Evofem Biosciences stock, then keep watching because we're going to look at the company's recent news, how's the market trading the company, and what are the technicals telling us, and more importantly, what is the best trading approach. As the market is still very volatile for the moment, we should always be mindful about which positions we pick up, as well as their individual timing and exposure. Before the video begins, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Evofem had a great price action sequence over the past week or so, and a lot of traders are hoping that this upward tendency would continue. I initially believed that the stock would undergo some retracements or at least losing some steam after the initial push. And it turns out that the market simply slowed down without necessarily going through large sell-offs that we usually see. Maybe the stock hasn't gone through that phase just yet, or maybe the anticipation is so strong that a retracement will happen once the spike continues to a much higher level. From the price action perspective, it certainly looks like the stock has a lot of expectations going on and that the interest would last for at least another few weeks. The question that remains is about the stock's ability to hold on the current levels until the company receives a new wave of positive news. I think that it'll most likely hold on the current level for the time being and continue its attempt to climb. Now, let's also take a look at the technicals of the stock. The trading volume of Evofem Biosciences has recently been around 29 million shares versus an average volume of 86 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, the price fluctuated between $0.28 cents and $14.93. The volume of shares traded tells us how many shares are being bought and sold at any given time in the market and if there's enough liquidity to support a trading strategy. If the float is very thin, it would be very easy to influence the stock price, but low liquidity could mean that the demand is limited as well. When we compare the current volume against the average volume, there might be some possibility for trend reversals or breakthrough if the difference is very large. For example, if the stock were to break through, the current volume would be significantly higher than the average volume. The market cap for Evofem Biosciences is currently around $32 million compared to the enterprise value of $174 million. To put simply, the market cap is the fair market value of the company based on the current market sentiment, the company's reputation, and other macroeconomic factors, whereas the enterprise value is usually the cost the company has already paid for its assets once paying off the debts. It's worth mentioning that one of the most significant assets for many growth companies tends to be the intangibles, so they are the guarantees or pledges for a brighter future, such as brands, intellectual properties, and schematics. For startups, most of their valuations are based on those intangibles, which could be valued in more favorable market terms. In other words, this means that there could be a huge difference between the market cap and the enterprise value, giving a false impression to the market participants that a company is trading at a discount. It's only trading below the book value, but it doesn't mean that a company itself is necessarily undervalued. It's possible that a company itself was overvalued in the first place and that it has deflated itself ever since. As we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 227% higher than the one-month low, 227% higher than the three-month low, and 227% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which gives us a hint of the market sentiment, the implied volatility is 228% versus the historical volatility of 345%. The put call volume ratio is currently around 0.42. It is normal for most stocks to have a higher put volume than what they truly deserve as many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 8.7 thousand contracts a day, versus the 30-day average of 18,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 200,000 contracts versus the 30-day average of 134,000 contracts. The option contract are tools allowing traders to hedge their risk, increase their exposure with limited downside, or as a revenue stream. They are derivative contract based on the underlying security. 
They give traders the possibility to buy or sell the security at a predetermined strike price and helps limiting the potential downside. The put option allows selling at the strike price, usually chosen for anticipated downturn, and the call options allow buying at the strike price, usually chosen for the anticipated bullish run. In terms of the shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 53% of the outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, Mirador, and BlackRock. Usually, it is best to see some institutional participation when holding a stock long term, because this offers a layer of stability and a token of reliability in the medium to long term. It means that the market is confident that it'll deliver value in the long term, which is an important factor to consider for investors. I personally consider the minimum threshold to be around 25-30% to 30 of institutional ownership, although there are many exceptions to this rule as there will always be great companies mostly owned by retail traders. Let's also take a look at the short interest of the stock, which is the number of positions that will profit from falling stock price. The way it works is that the short positions will borrow the shares from the broker, sell them in the market, and buy them back later, profiting from the difference between the two timings. If there are significant short interest, usually above 25-30%, to 30%, there could be a potential for a short squeeze, whereby traders will buy the stock up, forcing those with short positions to redeem their positions to avoid further losses, acting as a buy for the stock's price action. This is what people refer to as a short squeeze, and it became a popular concept in recent times with stocks like GameStop and AMC being successfully short squeezed. The current short interest is around 48% of the total float, and 49% of the transactions coming out from the dark pools. Usually, if the short interest is above 15% of the total volume, and that a significant percentage of that volume is outside of public exchanges, this could suggest that there are institutional positions taken to short the stock. Now, I don't think that it's the case for Evofem at the moment. I would recommend to build a position in Evofem and to leave a certain amount of space for later purchases in case it retraces. I would recommend to commit between 1-3% to of your portfolio in the stock and would also recommend to split the allocation in batches of 20-30% to at a time so that you can purchase more if it retraces. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option and assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up or ended around the world, 
I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, the degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When company announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.